David Hestinus, and I was asked to uh, give a tutorial on geometric calculus with the statement that um, the book that was written by me and uh, Gerrit Sobchak, my student, uh, is reputed to be difficult to read. In considering the audience, we have many experts here on geometric algebra and some beginners, I believe. So I thought that the best thing I could do would be to give a, uh, an overview of the objectives of geometric calculus and a little bit of the historical uh, context. So the subject of geometric algebra, I mean geometric calculus, of course, the word calculus is intended as in differential calculus. So think of, of tensor calculus uh, and other approaches to describing differentiable functions on manifolds and so on. You could say that geometric calculus was a program rather than a subject because it started out as a program, for me at least. I started in the 1950s. And in those times, Clifford algebra was never talked about as something associated with physics. It was a separate subject, as was Grassmann algebra, a separate subject scarcely represented, mentioned in regard to physics, except in France, I suppose. The first readings on differential geometry that I had in the 50s was a book by Lishnerowitz called Holonomy Groups, and it was in French. And this was the only reference that I had to differential forms, although I had contact with a professor, Barrett O'Neill, who wrote books on differential geometry, and he was one of the first to talk about Grassmann algebra and these things in connection with differential geometry, at least in the United States. So mathematics, my objective in beginning with The concept of differential calculus, by the way, the f as far as I know, the first time that the term geometric calculus was used was in the title of my thesis, which was called Geometric Calculus in Elementary Particles. And my objective then was to connect up various pieces of mathematics with physics. To put it in a larger context, I would like to quote a statement by the famous Russian mathematician V. I. Arnold. If you just Google V. I. Arnold, you can probably find this statement with a long paragraph explaining his views on it. It goes like this. Mathematics is a branch of physics, which is part of natural science. Mathematics is that branch of physics where the experiments are cheap. And then he goes on to say that in the middle of the 19th century, an experiment was started, and that experiment was to separate mathematics from physics. Now this was a talk on the teaching of mathematics, which was commissioned to him at an international conference on mathematicians after 
he, as a Russian expatriate, had taught at Ecole Normale in France, mathematics, and he concluded that that experiment was a disaster. A recent report that I read estimates that 90% of the mathematicians produced in the United States today know zero physics. Back in the 19th century, earlier part of the 19th century, there was no separation between mathematics and physics. Theoretical physics and mathematics were essentially one and the same. The separation started at the, at the latter part of the 19th century, and then it continued until just after World War II, when, at least in the United States, they dropped the requirement that everyone with a degree in mathematics should have a minor in physics. So this was something of the setting in which I was working to bring together what I had learned about mathematics because my father was a mathematician and I spent most of my graduate time actually in the mathematics department at UCLA. Maybe 50-50, half physics, half mathematics. Anyway, so the result of my thesis with the name geometric calculus included most of what, of, of what you will find in my book published in 1966, Space-Time Algebra. One thing was different. After I had finished my thesis, in which I did a separate analysis using the Pauli algebra and, and the Dirac algebra, because the Pauli algebra is an algebra over two by two matrices and the Dirac algebra is an algebra of four by four matrices. When I was translating and writing things, everything in terms of geometric algebra without any matrix representation, I had kept them se separate and I worked them out fully, full details about calculus and everything separately. And three months afterwards, I realized, my God, they are the same. And the concept that enables you to see them as the same, that is to see the Pauli algebra as a subalgebra of the Dirac algebra. <coughs> now you can't do that with matrix algebra because one is two by two and the other, but there is a subalgebra uh, of the Pauli algebra. It's a representation of the Pauli algebra by four by four matrices, and that's called Dirac's alpha matrices. Nobody had ever mentioned any of these kinds of things. So when I saw that, and that is now encoded in space-time split, and it, the concept of space-time split is the same, uh, is the origin of the concept of the conformal split, which was mentioned in the last talk. Anyway, my book Space-Time Algebra introduced the concept of a vector derivative, the first step in doing a truly geometric calculus and the fundamental theorem of integral calculus. And this raised questions with regard to differential forms, which I was studying intensely, but I did not see completely the relationship between them when I finished that book. But then I realized from the study of the vector derivative that that merited a little more. So here I'll use this arrow as a pointer so I don't have to turn around and turn my back mm -hmm. against you. And I wrote two papers, multivector calculus and multivector functions, and what they did was generalize, from a, just a mathematical point of view, the geometric algebra, or if you will, Clifford algebra, to include complex variable theory in a, in a uh, seamless way. And there I discovered this generalization of the Cauchy integral formula, which was quite amazing to me and amazing to other people. Um, you will hear this mentioned many times for people talking in Clifford analysis because the same thing has been rediscovered several times independently. It's been said that all of the important theorems or ideas have are multiple discoveries. 
because they are really embedded in the culture of mathematics and physics and then different people filter out the signal and make a separate thing. So I'll say a little bit about that, but still, then there are issues concerning the connection. The issues fundamentally are issues as I see it as relationships between physics and mathematics. My objective is to unify them, that there is one mathematics and I believe that the historical development, or not, not just believe, I've argued in many papers and lectures and so on, that the historical development supports the view that geometric algebra and calculus is an evolution in mathematics, which has been going on for the whole history of mathematics. And it gets split up in different factions with different terms for various social reasons. And the sociology of what's going on, the relationship between physics and mathematics is very interesting. And many of you have stories of your own about this sociology. Okay. Anyway, these questions that were raised about the relationship to differential forms and then started here in multi notice it says multivector calculus because I was, although I had used the term geometric calculus in my thesis, I was not so sure that it justified being a universal language. So I called it multivector calculus in these papers. And it was only in uh, some year, the next few years, that I was finally convinced as we worked out more and more stuff. When I finally understood the relationship between differential forms and geometric calculus, which I believe many people in Clifford analysis and so on today do not really understand, okay? But anyway, when I felt that I understood that, that was the time when I said, okay, yes, I can call this geometric calculus, Clifford calculus, it is a Clifford al geometric algebra, this is a universal system that has been evolving and we are all just playing certain parts in that evolution. So the central objective is this unification of the language. Now this book was mostly written by 1975. I added some things after, after I had the promise from the publisher, well actually it was from the editor to publish it, and then I had the book completed, I submitted it, and, and it was rejected by the publisher as opposed to the editor. Don't send your manuscripts if they are commissioned by an editor. Don't send it to the publisher, send it to the editor. Because the publisher sent it to somebody else and somebody else didn't like geometric algebra or never heard of it and so it can't be good because I never heard of it. And uh, uh, so I wasn't worried though because I had plenty of other things to do. And then uh, th a couple of years later, I was at a conference at MIT where uh, I had a letter from uh, famous mathematician Giancarlo Rota of MIT. He had asked me how he could secure a copy of my book, Space Time Algebra. And it just happened that I was at a conference at MIT, so I went in and talked to him. And I asked him, why is it that you wanted a copy of my Space Time Algebra? And he pulled out some papers on invariant theory. And I looked at that and I said, hey, that's what I've been doing in writing this book. And he was good. Invariant theory is, grew out of the theory of determinants in the middle of the, of the 19th century uh, by Cayley and um, Sylvester, mainly. Um, and I saw, gee, I can do all these things. So I added a bunch of theorems of determinants, which I could do overnight, because I had practically everything there. And uh, I also had a student working on group theory who actually, uh, when I went on sabbatical leave, he left and quickly got a quick uh, PA. He was a man in a hurry. And so he went and became uh, a multi, multi-millionaire almost um, and didn't finish his thesis. So I had the, the last chapter on group theory was uh, what I had tell, told him that he should be writing for his thesis. And so I wrote that up. Okay, so why is it, why is it difficult? I, would, I can 
as far as I know, very few have mastered it. Um, but let me tell you the first reason it's difficult is because the fir first few chapters or pieces of the first few chapters were written f in papers for mathematics journals. Now, mathematics journals have a terrible turnaround time in terms of publication. And after three years, sending it to mathematical journals and getting rejections, but never rejections for the content. They always said, these papers are too long for these journals that should be in a book. And so then I got the contract with the book, and then the book was rejected, and so on. You see, it wasn't published until 1984, finally got published. Uh, there's more, much more to the story about why it was delayed. Anyway, I was mostly doing other things, so I didn't worry too much about it. But of the few who have mastered it, I would say the first are Anthony Lazenby, who is here, Chris Doran, and Steve Gull. And I am very pleased, actually proud, that I believe this was the stimulus for their wonderful work on gauge theory gravity which, if you haven't heard about it, which I'm afraid most of you haven't, is a different approach to general relativity than the standard approach. And an amazing thing is how few people in general relativity have realized that there's a better way to do everything than, uh, than they're doing it. But they are in their own insular group, as there are many insular groups in mathematics. Let me just mention, for those of you who want an introduction, which may be simpler, I, my appreciation of it was written in a paper to uh, Foundations of Physics, and that might give you a start if you want. But the authors themselves are very competent. Anyway, my book Space-Time Algebra gave coordinate-free, for the first time, coordinate-free formulations of Maxwell's equation, Dirac equation, and Einstein's equation for general relativity, first time. However, then there is the issue of solving it. So you need, if you have invariant equations, you deserve uh, coordinate-free equations, you deserve coordinate-free methods to do it. Now there are were very few court. Many people tried coordinate-free methods, but they failed to do anything that was really efficient. And so that became an issue of developing this coordinate-free geometric calculus. And here are the major topics. Some of these topics have general names, like linear and multilinear algebra, but the approach is linear and multilinear without matrices, making the concept of vector more fundamental than the fu component uh, uh, concept of coordinates. So now there, 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 there is an outline which I was asked to prepare, which I guess you will be making available, uh, including some, how many papers? 10 papers that are related, which expand in things that are on that, in, that, in that book. So there's a little guide that you could use with papers which will be downloaded for people who are in a serious study. Of course, we can't study anything seriously. About all we can do is point the way that there's something that maybe you want to look at, all right? For example, you might want to know why are there no diagrams in the book, Clifford Algebra to Geometric Algebra, where the reason is it was hard enough just to get the manuscript typed. Making diagrams at that time was an enormous process. Now, I did make diagrams. This was before desktop pu publishing. Those of you who don't know life before desktop publishing, when my book was published, the manuscript at, at Arizona State University, a large university, we had only one typist for the physics, chemistry, and mathematics department to type out technical manuscripts. And the typing of my manuscript was, uh, took about three years. And they got delayed. Anyway, and if you wanted to have a diagram, 
through all kinds of processes. Now you can draw a diagram. Anyway, the diagrams for uh, new foundations to classical mechanics, which I think has more diagrams than any other book on classical mechanics, they were drawn by my beloved wife, uh, but it was a huge problem. Had to, everything had to be done by hand. Okay. So let's talk about universal geometric algebra. You know these things, otherwise you wouldn't be here, pretty much. Uh, so I won't spend much time. Uh, I want to emphasize, though, th the importance of talking about real geometric algebra, Clifford algebra over the complex numbers. That's all right, but you can always embed it in geometric algebra, and there's always a lesson to be learned. Because when you have uh, an imaginary unit to introduce an object, a scalar object that commutes with things that squares to minus one, there are many ways to do it, and the different ways have different geometric meaning. For example, it was emphasized by the shell that when you are rotating in a plane, the object that does the rotator, a quaternion or a bivector, it squares to minus one. But when you are doing space-time algebra, there's an indefinite signature between space and time. It distinguishes between space and time. That's a different meaning for square. And there are others. Okay, so there are mo so. It forces you always to think about what is the meaning of it. Now, there are wonderful techniques developed by mathematicians and so on, but I like to encourage people to think about unification, putting things together and seeing how things connect up, because you always learn something. In fact, usually the best things are learned by putting together different approaches. I've certainly learned an awful lot. OK, so you know these ideas. First of all, let me say that the dimension of our space, so you start with a vector space and you have a signature because you have, as you've already heard about it, okay? And this dimension can go to infinite dimension and I recommend the concept of universe of the geometric calculus book is that you always work in infinite dimensional space. An infinite dimensional geometric algebra has all signatures, has all possibilities, and I will say a little bit more about that. And then, however, if you want a three-dimensional one, there is a pseudoscalar. You pick a pseudoscalar, which is a k-vector for a k-dimensional, or an n-vector for an n-dimensional space, and you define a vector to be in that space if its wedge product with that thing is zero. That's the same way of saying that the intersection of these linear spaces defined by vectors with a n-dimensional space is equal to, well, that, that, it, that it's a subspace. So that defines a subalgebra. So that's the universal way of thinking about these things. Each pseudoscalar produces the projection, and then you can separate out. And it also tells you what's not in the algebra. It not only projects into the algebra, but it has a, it has a projection and a rejection. I'll say a little bit more about that. OK, so this is the general picture of a geometric algebra uh, for a finite dimensional geometric algebra of dimension n. Uh, and of course, the ladder, the, the rungs of the ladder are, the, are proportional to the number of elements, which are given by the binomial coefficient in expansion. One vector, two vector, three vector, you know these things. But pseudo vector, pseudo scalar, pseudo vector going down the other way um, by symmetry. Now here's an issue that I would like to address, because this is one of the issues that separates mathematics from geometric calculus. And that is the notion of quadratic forms with respect to calculations. We, you heard the definition of Clifford algebra in terms as the algebra of a quadratic form. To my knowledge, that was first formulated in the 1945s by Claude Chevalier in mathematics. Nobody, least of all Clifford, thought about Clifford algebra being associated with quadratic forms. And to say 
that Clifford algebra is the algebra of quadratic forms is to, to redu it reduce it to a subspace of the universal algebra. And so it's a narrowing concept. Now it's true, you can always make a quadratic form out of it, but you don't have to talk about quadratic forms because what's more general than the quadratic forms according to the mathematicians? It's a linear form, and a linear form is the mapping of vectors into scalars. And they find, gee, linear forms are form a vector space. So you start with a vector space, and then you have a vector space of mappings into scalars. But in geometric algebra, you can do exactly the same thing. There's more than one way to do it, but here's the most general way. The linear forms can be represented in geometric algebra without assuming a metric. You see, just because you have a quadratic form doesn't mean that that has to be interpreted as a metric. So you start with a vector space spanned by vectors. Now, they, now the mathematicians will talk about a vector space of forms indicated by star. They're not vectors, supposedly. However, if we think of them as vectors, and the way they do the mapping is you have an inner product between the starred vectors and the other vectors, and so it satisfies. Now, there's an associative outer product. Each one of these spaces is, has a null. Notice this is delta ij. So these square, all the vectors, these are null spaces, OK? And they generate a Grassmann algebra in the well-known way, which is just geometric algebra with, uh, and in this case, everything. So we assume the null vector. Actually, I hadn't said before. But we assume the null vectors. And then Vn has the geometric product given by this. And now we define this symmetric product to be the inner product. And lo and behold, this is the algebra of creation and annihilation operators that are in physics. And that's the most general algebra. It's an infinite dimensional algebra. It is the infinite dimensional algebra of geometric products with all, signature, all possible signatures. OK, a good way to look at the subdivision is you take these vectors. You have null spaces, Vn and Vn star. Now, if you take sums of those things, you get vectors, and they provide Euclidean space. If you take the differences, they span an anti-Euclidean space. And you get all possible signatures. Make this an infinite dimensional. Now, this is called a term mother algebra, which, uh, which was given in our book, in our paper with uh, Chris Doran. Lee Groups and, and Frank Summond and, and his student. Uh, Lee Groups is spin groups. And you expand that to all dimensions, and you've got the, the entire, call it the grandmother algebra. So if the mother algebra has an n-dimensional vector spaces of all possible signatures. Now, so here we have a null space, a Euclidean space, and a Euclidean space, but you can cut a Cut them in a space, cut a line through that, and you can get all possible signatures. So I call that the grandmother algebra, when you make n infinite. Everything is a projection. Oh, OK. Now, um, the early part of my book has a lot of stuff, OK? Algebraic definitions and identities, some people have noticed that there's a certain circularity about that. I won't speak to that, except that there are many ways to, to, to make definitions, and I tried to talk about that, that there are, ter are alternatives for making various definitions, and some choices are better for the purposes of computer science, for instance, as Leo Dorst has made one of the, one of the choices. Okay. So um, let's see. Yes, there are many identities between inner and outer products. Now, Clifford never even talked about inner and outer products when he wrote his first paper. In fact, the amazing thing is Clifford was a tremendous geometer, but he never used what's called Clifford algebra to do any geometry, although he gave it the name geometric algebra. 
because he was regarding it, as it's clear in his papers, as just an addition uh, to, to uh, Grossman's algebra. And it's a contribution to this universal algebra of ge geometric algebra that I think has been developing. I discovered only after the book had been written and finally Grossman's work, Aus Danum's Lehre, had been translated to English that in fact e almost every identity and inner and outer products that we had derived had been derived by Grossman. Okay? And Giancarlo Rota related this to determinants and invariant theory. Now I should say that the place that this has gone to the most sophistication is in the work of Hongbo Li. And the thing is, you've got all these families of identities. But some of these identities, for example, you will find in my paper on projective geometry or other places, that Desargues theorem can be reduced in geometric algebra to a single identity. And the theorem is, if the left side is satisfied, then the right side is satisfied, identically zero. And that's the whole theorem. Virtually all theorems in geometry, and I think probably all of geometry, non-Euclidean, Euclidean, whatever kind, can be reduced to identities in geometric algebra. And Hongbo Lee has noticed, you, you may have noticed when you start doing these things and you try to derive things that there are, you can do inner and outer products in different orders and things expand differently and you get complications, you get, uh, uh, there are many pathways, okay? So, so all of the theorems I, I propose in, Geometry can be written in that way. Then came the issue of dif differentiation, the concept of vector derivative, which I will say more about. But then I also defined multivector derivative and the simplicial derivative. Now, I won't go into the difference. It's in the book. But while, we, while I was working on this, we had, I was wondering how, what is the right way to define a multivector derivative, differentiation with respect to a multivector. And the simplicial derivative was actually an alternative to that, um, which I will let you read about if, you, if you're interested. You can actually do without the, the simplicial derivative. And for s certain purposes that we used, it's simpler to, if you're just doing ordinary linear algebra, not to use it. Um, but that's in the, in the papers that are in, in the handouts. Uh, however, I thought that, the, that, that, that multivector derivative was such an obscure concept that after we wrote it in this thing, I, I didn't mention it, even though I said it was a central concept in, in the book. So I didn't refer to it. And then to my amazement, the Lazenbees and Doran used it to write a wonderful paper uh, on uh, using multivector calculus, or multivector derivative for a analyzing Lagrangians. And they have just talked about this in this recent book uh, edited by uh, Leo Dorst. And uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right, okay. First chapter, first chapter, but guess what? They used the multivector derivative, but they didn't say the name. <laughs> they didn't call it that. They said, we use these powerful techniques in this other paper. If, if I pick the sentence up. However, some other guys that I had never heard of from Australia, Valkenberg and all which, they also have papers in there where they extensively use the multivector derivative. So I guess it isn't that hard, okay? And I recommend it because it's very powerful. You can differentiate spinners without breaking up components. That's, that's what they're doing. So once you master that, and even better, once you get it in a computer program, you know, and then it can do, the, then the computers can do the, the complexities. You don't have to think about it. Then there is linear multilinear functions. Now that was where the simplicial derivative was first analyzed with respect to this issue because it had to do with differential forms because differential forms are multilinear functions. Now, one of the things, innovations in this book, which I recommend to you, I defined, we defined the vector derivative before doing linear algebra because, in fact, 
If you take the directional derivative, that's easy, you know what that is, the directional derivative. That's the dot product of a vector with the vector derivative. If for every function that forms the differential, which I will talk about later, this underbar means differential of the function. I highly recommend this notation to you. It, it works very wonderfully. You start out with a function which is a mapping on a multi-dimensional multi space. You take the, the vector derivative and that gives you a mapping of the tangent space. Okay. Now, if that mapping of the tangent space is equal to the space itself, then it's a linear function. And so all the products that you do with matrix algebra and tensor algebra, contractions and everything can all be done by differentiation. But you have to, get, you have to learn how to differentiate simple functions first in order to take advantage of that thing. But the usual way of teaching linear algebra, do things the hard way first and then learn the simple ways later if you're still in the, still in the field. Okay, now the adjoint function, now you know what the adjoint of a matrix is, that's just the gradient. You take your function, you take the dot product, take the adjoint. And then this innovation, which came from, our from learning how to do differential forms, then I realized that the general concept was this concept of outer morphism, which means that it's preserving the outer product. It's a mapping, a linear mapping, and what that does is that it takes spaces of bivectors and tells you how they transform given a linear transformation on the vectors, okay? So that, I think, is a hugely powerful uh, method for linear algebra that has hardly been used, as far as I know it's only been used in papers that I have written and uh, uh, haven't come close to uh, producing the advantages of it. Now here's another thing to look at, and this has to do with the issues. I put this very simple thing here because I don't see people using it. So, you know, the theory of determinants came from the problem of, of solving systems of simultaneous linear equations. So you can turn that into a vector equation with scalar coefficients. And the problem is to solve for the scalar coefficient. So you, so you eliminate one by taking the wedge product. And then, better than just Grassmann algebra, in geometric algebra, you can divide by bivectors. And so here are the coefficients. They're just ratios of bivectors. And then you can expand it expand this theorem, well, I'll tell you that expansion in the next slide, uh, to get the usual expression for, um, this is just using these identities for inner and outer products to get the usual expression for determinant. So I maintain, or I recommend, that you look at matrix algebra as subsidiary to geometric algebra, in fact, I submit, and it's up to you to decide whether you agree, that matrix algebra, all the operations of matrix algebra, can be simplified by using geometric algebra. Here is the outer product. I don't know about you, but I was very, I, th I thought determinants were very mysterious when I first learned them. But when I learned that a determinant of rank n is just the inner product between two n vectors that is decomposed into products of each one of those things. And here are the theorems, the expansion. And look at this thing, okay? You dot a vector into an n vector, and that gives you an expansion wh where it dots each vector simultaneously, changing the sign as it runs down the line. That is actually the Laplace expansion in determinant theory. You just have to fold it in with the rest of where that E1 came from. So that's what this slide is emphasizing. And so Kramer's rule, which is you start with any set of linear set of vectors and you find the coefficients by wedging 
with these things and then taking a ratio, divide. All right. So it's a simple thing which I suspect that many of you who are quite good with geometric algebra actually haven't thought about. Now let's go to the issues having to do with calculus. What is a manifold? A manifold of dimension m. It's a set on which differential and integral calculus is well defined. I think that's general enough to cover. Now the standard definition requires that you cover the manifold by charts and local coordinates and then the proofs are required to establish results are independent of coordinates. Geometric calculus defines a manifold as any set which is isomorphic to a vector manifold. Okay? Now, a vector manifold then is a set of vectors in GA that generates at each point a tangent space with a pseudoscalar. That's it, okay? Take any set that you have. If it's smooth enough, what makes it an n-dimensional manifold? It's got an n-dimensional pseudoscalar at every point. Now this generalizes so you can have creases and edges and stuff like that, but uh, that requires more sophisticated things to do. Now, the advantage of this is that you can do coordinate-free calculus, and the calculus is done directly with algebraic operations on the point, uh, on the points themselves, and you don't have to map it into, into a, a vector space, which is what, what coordinates are doing, is mapping onto a real vector space so you can do the real calculus of, of Euclidean vector space that you learned and then you map it back. That's, you don't need that. You go directly to the vector manifold. And the geom, um, okay. Now, this manifold can be embedded in this n-dimensional space. So, you, so uh, now that means that there are embedding theorems having to do with well, what I claim. Uh, there are theorems in mathematics that I think can be translated about, about the dimension of an embedding space. But I claim every manifold can be embedded in this infinite dimensional geometric algebra manifold. So we developed a calculus to handle that. Okay, well, this slide, I guess slides will be projected. We're not going to have too much time. So uh, this is how to do a coordinate frame. Notice that you have coordinate functions and points. You have points parameterized by a set of functions. And then, co so that maps the set of functions into a point. And then you have an inverse mapping, which is mapping the points, uh, the, the coordinates, uh, the, the point back to coordinates, OK? And then you just do the chain rule, OK? Now, how do we define the vector derivative is fundamental to this thing? Notice that that these basic vectors are directional derivatives and these vectors are essentially gradients okay that's the the duality between a linear transformation and be, because these are linear transform that's what the coordinate system is giving you is a linear transformation into the tangent space back and forth between some n dimensional space. So how do you define a vector derivative without coordinates? Well, that is defined without pictures, I'm sorry, but you can have the pictures that are in this slides if they're produced. And so I can come back to that if you need more details. Here is the fundamental theorem of calculus, okay, which deserves a little bit of talk. And this is the first form of the fundamental theorem that was in my book, uh, Space-Time Algebra. And I noted this peculiar thing that this gradient, or vector derivative, gradient is perfectly fine, or nabla if you want, perfectly good, you need a short name for it, because it is the most fundamental derivative, and the scalar derivative can be just regarded as a special case of that. But I noticed that you have a m vector. The volume elements are m vectors for curved surfaces, OK? You want to project it. And this is the projection of the, the gradient 
So you first s learn about the gradient operator in an n-dimensional n space, and then you're looking at subspaces for, uh, for a surface, and this projects it into it, and the fundamental theorem is that the integral over a closed region uh, is equal to the, of, the, of this derivative, is equal to the integral of the function around its boundary. All the fundamental theorems of integration theorems are really based on that variance and somewhat generalizations. So, so you can define the vector derivative on the manifold as the projection from a higher dimensional space onto the manifold. See here? Whoops. So here's the projection. You project on the pseudoscalar, dots it out, then you take its dual, and this is the vector derivative on the, and so I've called that the tangential derivative, which is because it's throwing away all differentiates orthogonal to the surface. And then this is a definition of the vector derivative without any coordinates. But you have to know how to define multi-vector areas and those things. You might say, well, gee, well, you can do it with coordinates if you want. This hasn't been used too much. But I submit that there are advantages to this thing because this will apply when you've got creases in your manifold. It will handle those things automatically because it's an integral. It's defining the derivative in terms of an integral. So you will get left and right derivatives on, on singularities and stuff like that. That's all to be worked out, but I'm sure it can be. Okay, so the theory of differential forms is generalized by geometric algebra. Finally, uh, that's what the ma a major accomplishment of, of that book in which I gave criticism. Now, the ordinary differential forms is a special case of this where the differential forms, so he here's a differential form. It means that it is a multi-vector valued K form. K form means it's a linear function on k vectors, on the tangent spaces, okay? And that's it, any such thing. So you can have L equal dx, and here you have the funny thing. It's a k vector valued k form. Now the peculiar thing that I find that people that do Clifford analysis think about differential forms and Clifford algebras as separate things. And so you get this kind of thing they finally realize that you want to have k vector valued. You want to have geometric algebra valued forms and not scalar valued, because the classical differential forms as developed by Cartan is only scalar valued. And the advantage is you can use Cauchy's integral theorem. And Cauchy's, uh, and Cauchy's theorem is formulated if you allow k vector valued forms. So you get much more for the, for, for the cost. OK, so differentiate. You have to learn how to differentiate by vectors. If you haven't learned how to do this, you may want to know how to differentiate. You, you can reduce things to the derivative points by coordinates, OK, and then define, but you notice, that the gradient of this point x with respect to any one of the coordinates is the unit vector associated with the coordinate. Once you have learned the derivative of a point and of the distance between two points, which is easily done here, then you never have to use coordinates for another derivative. You know, when you learn differential calculus, you don't go back to the definition of a derivative every time you want to differentiate something. You know that they're how to differentiate x to the nth and sine of x and those kind of things. Same thing in geometric algebra. You learn, define a couple of basic definitions, and then you learn how to use the chain rule. So here are these vectors, and if you just look in books on electrodynamics or whatever and see how much simpler these derivatives are. Once you know how to differentiate, then you can use the chain rule and do more and more derivatives. Now, 
there's a redundancy in conventional mathematics. This is the fundamental theorem of, of calculus. But that's just the zero-dimensional case of this thing, okay? There's Green's theorem, well, the one-dimensional. Green's theorem, two-dimensional. Stokes' theorem, three-dimensional. Gauss's theorem, all of it. And here's so-called generalized Stokes' theorem uh, as, uh, as in calculus of differential forms. Uh, but these are unified in a single fundamental theorem, which I have given you, okay? And then there are ways to do antiderivatives, which all of you are familiar with from use of Green's functions. But uh, I submit that you should look and learn to think about these things in terms of, uh, of um, the vector derivative. And so this is the antiderivative, which uses an integral to do it. And you get theorems like you can solve electrostatic and magnetostatic problems without going to potentials, OK? Because you can integrate the, the equations immediately. And here is the generalization of Cauchy's integral theorem to n dimensions, and for the case r equal to 2, notice that we can take the, we can map the, um, the variable in two dimensions into a complex number and just rewrite these terms, and that's exactly the form of the generalized integral, Cauchy integral formula. Generalized, okay? Most of the books in, uh, in complex variable theory just have this part. They don't have this part, which is an integral over the area, okay? Now, in fact, that was discovered originally by Pompidou in 1910. That was the first generalization of Cauchy's integral formula to include an area, which he defined here as the derivative with respect to an area, okay? That's a differential form. Then uh, it was generalized uh, to a volumetric theorem uh, derivative by Theodorescu in 1931. And Matreya, if you just look up Matreya, he has a history of, of this stuff. He's been more careful than most of the people in tracing who did what. And then there, were, there then, then there's Feuter, who independently of my paper uh, on generalized Cauchy integral formula, did one with quaternions. But of course, his generalization was reduced to quaternion spaces, whereas my generalization is to n dimensions. Um, OK. So let me emphasize this business about the difference between a vector derivative and Dirac operator. I really don't know why the mathematicians, in Clifford analysis particularly, insist on calling this thing the Dirac operator, okay? Where these are the Dirac gammas. It was really invented by Hamilton. And the divergence and curl of vector derivative, that's really what this thing is. And I think even that notation was invented by Hamilton. I'm not, I'm not sure about that. It might have been. Anyway, um, so, but they are the same thing. And the trouble with calling that the Dirac operator is that it talks about that it's something special to Clifford analysis or so on. No, it's the derivative with respect to a point which applies in any application of differential geometry or whatever, okay? So Clifford analysis applies differential forms to Clifford algebra, whereas geometric calculus integrates, develops differential forms within geometric algebra, in geometric calculus. It's all one and the same subject. OK, so there are more details in these various papers. Uh, they are all included in this handout, which I hope will be somewhere on the web or whatever you, 
however you want to distribute it. I included the papers with the outline. Now, this is wonderful, okay? I've already talked about you have a function, which is a mapping of n-dimensional space into an n-dimensional space, but it's a vector. It's, it's a manifold, so it's a, a vector manifold. Every manifold can be isomorphic to a vector manifold. You want to do the differential geometric algebra of any arbitrary manifold, you map it into a vector manifold, and then you can do all of this stuff. Okay? The differential is the directional derivative, the adjoint, so the differential then takes, takes tangent vectors and maps it forward. And that's called push forward in, in lots of stuff on differential forms. And then you have the push back, which is just the gradient operator, which goes the other way. And in, in physics, uh, it's contravariant and covariant differential forms. OK, so. Now the outer morphism, you see, is the extension of all subspaces with the tangent space onto it. How does that map when you do a mapping? And so, now the Jacobian, of course, is just the volume element of this thing, which you get the definition of the Jacobian without any coordinates. No coordinates needed to do the Jacobian. And, uh, well, the greatest application is Gauge theory of gravity, that was a key thing in developing it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a key thing. And uh, so now we have necessary tools for addressing coordinate free ge uh, differential geometry. We know how to differentiate, okay? There are two major methods talked about in my book. One is the method of mobiles, co moving frames, which uses spinners to rotate things, if you will. Uh, spinners in geometric algebra. And the other is the method of the sliding pseudoscalar, which slides over the manifold and you see how it changes. This method of mobiles is a translation, actually a real improvement, I think, of uh, Cartan's method of moving uh, uh, of mobile, mobiles because geometric algebra has spinners embedded in it, and spinners are the best way of handling the rotation. So, so that was all developed with some things that maybe you haven't seen before. Now let's just look at how to do differential geometry as a sliding. So here we have a manifold, and the manifold is characterized by having a pseudoscalar. This can be any dimension, okay? And this pseudoscalar will, can project a vector onto the tangent space or reject it. Okay, so this is the projection. And tangency, a vector is tangent at that, on that place. If, if the pseudoscalar says it, uh, it belongs in the space. Okay, now the whole thing is to do differential geometry is simply reduced to describing how the pseudoscalar slides along the manifold. Okay, so if I take a vector uh, an arbitrary vector, it doesn't even have to be in the tangent space or on the manifold. It's in this infinite dimensional space. You project it in there and the pseudoscalar does the projection. And now you differentiate it and the derivative of the projection operator, that's the thing that's called the shape. And the shape tensor determines all of the differential geometry, which I don't have the many details in the paper. But if you take the curl of it, for example, and uh, the divergence of this thing, you see the shape tensor is a bivector. You were talking about rotating uh, on a manifold. That's all included here. The, because you've got the pseudoscalar is moving on the manifold. It rotates. You can describe that rotation by a spinner. okay, And then this gives you the derivatives of it, its derivative is not in the tangent space in general if it's a curved manifold. But then there's a projection of that into the, into the tangent space and that projection gives you the Riemann curvature. And then there's a rejection of it which gives you the extrinsic geometry which is a completely separate subject in ordinary course of differential. But in geometric algebra it's exactly one and the same thing with this method. 
So hardly anybody has ever ha has exploited this thing, and I think there's, including me, okay, I just didn't get around to doing any more of this stuff, but it has tremendous opportunities, this vector derivative, and then you can define what's called the covariant derivative, or just co-derivative, which is you take the differential, and then you project, the, in, or, in general, the derivative is outside of the man, of this tangent, tangent algebra, but then you just project it in, and lo and behold, that's the usual covariant derivative, okay? And uh, so there are many other identities and things to follow, a lot of stuff that can be developed, okay? So the shape bivector right here is the rotational velocity of the pseudoscalar as it slides along the manifold. It is a function of a vector because it tells you which direction you're sliding. So it's a bivector valued linear function, okay? And its commutator, this is amazing. If you recall the usual curvature, Riemann curvature, you have to take second derivatives. This, you just take the commutator of the shape tensor, you project it into the tangent algebra, that is the Riemann curvature. And you reject it to the external, and that is Gauss-Kodazy equations, that's the extrinsic algebra. Okay, well, I see we're about of out of time, but Lie groups and Lie algebras, there's more stuff on that, and actually, I've said a little bit about uh, group theory and geometric algebra, uh, I would recommend uh, looking at the book, uh, uh, at the paper, Lie groups as spin groups, which is in there, because I maintain actually everything having to do with Lie algebra can be done in geometry, everything whatsoever. It hasn't all been done, so there's a lot of translation that needs to be done, but this translation I recommend to you who might be interested in that, you will learn something new. There is no better way to learn a subject than to learn how to translate it into another subject, an another representation or whatever. Okay, so here are some challenges which I set down at the last conference. One is to incorporate into conformal geometric algebra, vector manifolds which haven't been used very much, the shape tensor and differential geometry. There are things to be learned to do that. It's clear it can be done. Finite element differential geometry still needs work. Uh, I recommend the Reggie calculus, which I'm sure hardly any of you have ever heard of. That's Tulio Reggie, who's a physicist, uh, and he developed it for, for doing a finite element uh, um, differential geometry in, in, uh, for, for, for general relativity. There's a notion of a tangent cone, which is a, not a full tangent space, okay? It has creases and edges and corner. My father developed this method and made wonderful applications in calculus of variations to handle these things, because calculus of variations can, but I, I warn you, this is a difficult thing to read, and so uh, to dig it out, but uh, handling creases and edges, uh, it's just, a, you just have to learn how to use the vector derivative in the tangent space. Okay, so there's more. And thank you very much. That's your tutorial on geometric calculus. Any questions? We'll have plenty of time to talk, and maybe it's better to eat. I, <laughs> I have a historical anecdote, if yeah, you allow good. me, okay, to claim some uh, predecessors uh, right. Uh, you mentioned uh, your book. Um, in 1976, the guy at Sobczyk on the Fulbright Scholarship came to University of Wrocław in Poland, and good. I was a grad student there. In his suitcase, he had your book with him. Uh, it was a huge manuscript, typewritten. And Garrett gave a series of wonderful seminars at that time. 
uh, the idea of doing calculations coordinate free was uh, new to physicists. Uh, and uh, it helped a lot to solve a problem that Professor Zhivuski, Jan Zhivuski at the university had. Essentially, if you translate this into a modern language, you would say how to create out of elements of a Clifford algebra of a Minkowski space-time conformal tensors. And uh, with the help of your book uh, that had indeed lots of formulas, and I am not to claim that uh, as a grad student at that time I understood the whole book, absolutely not. But uh, we understood enough to be able to use this coordinate-free calculation to prove Zhivuski's old idea that there are three different ways to embed or create conformal tensors, vectors in particular, that would transform correctly under the conformal group in the Minkowski spacetime uh, in terms of symmetric emission and anti-symmetric forms. Zhivuski, in fact, had idea that we should use anti-symmetric forms, but we showed that one could also use symmetric forms and Hermitian forms. And to accomplish that, we used formulas from Hessian's subject manuscript uh, that you mentioned uh, in 1975, that you finished by then, most of it. And we published a paper later, it was, I think, uh, 1982, in the Journal of Mathematical Physics, where we used and showed how these formulas were helpful. So it was a wonderful idea at the time. I don't hear much about this nowadays as far as using coordinate-free calculations, but at that time it was uh, like a brainstorming idea that came to us at the University of Wrocław. And I must say that it fell on the felt ground because Karczyk and Ozevich, uh, in particular Zhivulski, and many other, for example, Kwasniewski at Wrocław, and it was way before, I think, Doran, Chris Doran, uh, Doran's wonderful book later, uh, that we st they started uh, working on implementing geometric calculus uh, and the ideas of coordinate free calculations. Yes, to, to, to add to that, there's a lot Thank of things you. to say about that, but uh, just after Sobchak finished his dissertation with me, about half a year afterwards, uh, when I had written up these three papers that were submitted, then he left and went to, uh, to Poland as the only uh, American postdoc in, the, in, in Poland. And, uh, and then there is an, ad an adventure about how he got out of there, okay, because he was declared an American spy and had to be brought out in the underground. <laughs> so, so, uh, uh, and his pants, yeah. nothing else in Poland. That's right, including his home and, and, and his wife. Yes, and uh, yeah, he had a wife, yes, and he was also helped, in, I think, in Sweden, right? He went to Sweden or to Perth University, I think, maybe. Uh, his, but uh, he had nothing when he was leaving. That's right, because he had to sneak out, yeah. yeah. The only American, as far as I know, that was in Poland at that time. On your last slide, you have a lot of challenges. It's yeah. Gone. You had a lot of challenges. So one, you didn't say anything about linear algebra. So yeah, it's on. Well, um, I said linear algebra earlier. Yeah. You did. You did. I mean, do you think there's, it strikes me that there's lots of things that, you know, you showed how you can treat these matrices, tensors, as linear or multilinear functions. Yes. So isn't there an awful lot there to do to reproduce all the things that, you know. There are, there are indeed. There's a lot of things to yeah. do in linear algebra yet. Yes. Is any, have you done anything? <laughs> well, <laughs> I have Recently. some things in, anoth in <laughs> another paper, which is called the, de the design of linear algebra, I, but you already know, know that, that yeah. part. Garrett Sobchak, I assigned him <laughs> to do that, figure that all out. <laughs> and I think he's got, uh, um, some paper fairly recently that's on his website about what he has been doing. What I had seen did not satisfy me, but anyway, he did a lot more work on that particular thing than anybody else, I think. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I find that the first question might seem about top of it, but I teach some linear algebra. Uh, 
I'm now also doing classes in geometric algebra. Um, and then they say, so where's the SVD? Yeah. You know, because yep, they SVD, want to process yeah. geometric data. My talk on Wednesday is partly to move into that direction. And they ask, how do I do the SVD if I have that? So Raphael's remark earlier is very interesting. So that the paper the by Fausler. Fausler owns a paper on I digital gravity composition of a single number, of a single element of a single algebra. OK, that's so that's, that's what yeah, we have yeah. to look at, and especially in the yeah, concepts of You have to do the translation. Yeah, it's been clear yeah. that the translations yeah. can exist for every theorem. But, but they, uh, they really want to know where the great tools of linear algebra go when you switch over to geometric algebra, or they won't. And so we have to answer the question, and so they must. That. Yeah, that th to make the ATA uh, and then the eigenvalue decomposition of that. Yeah, but for the eigenvalue things, you you still find you'll also see that in my Wednesday paper that yeah you can define eigenvalue problems and recognize them in geometric algebra, but then you switch over to standard linear algebra packages that actually solve the eigenvalue problems. But okay, we'll talk about more about Wednesday. Uh, I did try this year to teach a class based on uh, Alan MacDonald's book, uh, Linear and Geometric Algebra, for first year computer science students. And um, that was tough going. <laughs> I think I. Uh, uh, by the way, Alan asked me to yeah, have a copy of his book of linear algebra, which will be on display for people and with a few cards. And uh, now he had asked me to be a co author of the book. And uh, uh, I, he wrote the first couple chapters, and I said, no, I can't do it this way, because he, he's taking it from the point of view of somebody who's taught years and years of linear algebra in mathematics courses, and he thinks you've got to make a gradual translation. Whereas my view is, you've got to start right away and get rotations maybe in the first chapter. You've got to do the geometric product. So, the, it's just historical kind of thing. So that's why, so then I said, okay, you, you just finished the book by yourself. I gave an intro, introduction uh, forward to it, but uh, um, uh, so my, my preference is to get to the good stuff quick and not, and not, and not try to, to, to reinvent history. I mean, if you look at ordinary Euclidean geometry, you know, they're still doing it the way Euclid did it for proving theorems and stuff like that. We've got some improvements since then. Yeah, so if you're interested in, maybe we should have a session somewhere on teaching these things. Yeah. I have some experiences to share based on this book and some other things. If, if I could add something to your comment. From my small experience teaching, for example, Clifford algebra or geometric algebra to engineers, you don't want to talk about tensors. Or the, you don't want to define Clifford algebra as a quotient algebra of a tensor <laughs> algebra <laughs> over the two-sided ideal, what you, uh, or even in terms of universal property, absolutely not. But what you would like to do is what we what we do actually. I'll be using this in my talk later. Uh, you use presentation. You just use generators, mm -hmm. and that's it. And you start first day with generators, and you say now you do calculations, and the student leaves after the first class, and the student is able to do calculations immediately. Right. Yeah, there's and more than that. Yeah. Yes, so that's right. Yeah. yeah, except he doesn't do any rotation. Yeah, yeah. he's yeah. going to just do linear. No more question or comment? Yeah, let's eat. <laughs> 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 Plenty of time for more questions.